it's such a vital time to talk about food, talk about food addiction, talk about choices that we've made over the holidays. Because mm-hmm. for a lot of us, I mean, the holidays is when we let loose. It's when we kind of get away from our standards and just let it go. Yep. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? I mean, can you talk about what happens over the holidays for most people? Empowering you organically, delivering content you trust with results you love. Welcome everyone to another episode of Empowering You Organically. I'm joined by my co-host, Terry ann Trevenin. Hey everyone. And we have a very special guest today, Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson. Hey, hey. Thanks for joining us. Terry ann do you want to give us a quick history, quick bio? Yes. So we're super excited to have Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson here today. She lives in Rochester, New York with her husband and three beautiful daughters. She is a New York Times bestselling author for her book, Bright Line Eating, The Science of Living Happy, Thin, and Free. She's also the president of the Institute for Sustainable Weight Loss. She is the founder and CEO of Bright Line Eating, which is a company with unprecedented track record for helping people lose all of their excess weight and live in a right sized body long term. And I love that, by the way. Mm-hmm. She has a PhD in brain and cognitive sciences. She's been a professor at the college level, the university level, for 13 years. And she has taught on the psychology of eating and the neuroscience of food addiction. Yeah, so excited to be here with you too. Yeah, thank you for joining us. I really wanted, I I was really pushing to have you here because we filmed just a couple of days before we air. And so this is going to come out on December 26th, the day after Christmas. Mm. And so it's, it's such a vital time to talk about food, talk about food addiction, talk about choices that we've made over the holidays. Mm -hmm. Because for a lot of us, I mean, the holidays is when we let loose. It's when we kind of get away from our standards and just let it go. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? I mean, can you talk about what happens over the holidays for most people? Yeah, totally. The holidays are kind of um, the the mag daddy sort of instance of this pattern that a lot of us fall into actually year round. It's this sort of pattern of indulgence followed by sort of Uh, turning over a new leaf and tightening up and like getting it back together, right? But during the holidays, there's sort of this widespread societal permission and sort of expectation of like, well, no one keeps their food together now, right? Like, like, let's be real. No one keeps their food together now. That's sort of the thinking, right? And so um, you add into that sort of um, a lot of extra activity, like, you know, we still have lives to lead and now we're buying presents and going to more parties and prepping more food, you know, food, like uh, sexy, exciting food and like um, you put on, and then family stress, right? So family is amazing, but it's also for a lot of us, um, you know, it's complicated, right? Um, it's, it, there's no guarantee that all of these parties and events and stuff are just filled with nothing but love and connection. There's like layers of stuff going on there, right? And so you put all this into this big cauldron and um, there's this sort of letting it all hang out that happens, this phase of um, I'm just taking my comfort in food, I'm not worrying about it now. And then there's this societal backlash that happens called January 1st, right? New Year's resolution time where it's like, well, now's the time to get it together. And, um, you know, uh, most people are doing that. And when you say it like that, it sounds emotionally chaotic. (laughs) <laughs> it does. Like when you put it in that context of like everyone's ramping up for the holidays and then the family expectations and the stress and the chaos of the holidays. And then all of a sudden it's like, all right, I got to get back on track. And it's like this heightened sense of awareness of where you're failing and everything. Like get your goals set and get back on track right. for the new year. It sounds totally. really chaotic. Well, you, I mean, even when you're trying to keep your shit together, right, you have other people that aren't, right? And mm. so you have your friends and your family that have decided to let loose and let go of their goals and oh come on eat some it's the holidays have some pie have this it's christmas so yeah there's all kinds of stuff that just makes it i think a a minefield when it's it's time to keep your goals and keep your personal commitments that you might do really well throughout the year Mm -hmm. but then at the holidays just everything collapses well this is a really interesting point jonathan because um we are living in the dark ages around food um, I don't know if you guys remember the movie Forrest Gump. Did oh, you see yeah. that yeah, movie, yeah, right? Yeah. And and when Forrest is a little boy and he's seeing the doctor and he's saying, you know, about his crooked spine and stuff and the doctor's got a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. You know, no. in that scene, that's the state of our society around food right now. 
where we are becoming overweight and obese at breathtaking, gobsmacking, horrifying rates. Our kids are destined to have type 2 diabetes at levels that, you know, we're going to be watching this generation of kids have legs amputated and go be going blind in their 30s and 40s at mass numbers. And um, and financially, as a society, we can't afford it. Like the heart disease and the diabetes and stuff, we're, we're about to go bankrupt uh, on a global scale because of how we're eating. And we're still at the point where if you try to say no thank you to pumpkin pie on Thanksgiving, people give you a hard time. Like you're like you're being some sort of ridiculous version of a like overzealot, like nobody diets on Thanksgiving. Come on. Right. It's like 1950 and you're trying to say no thank you to a cigarette or 1970 and you're trying to say no thank you to a drink on New Year's Eve. Now, I haven't had a drink in a long time. Nobody harasses me on New Year's Eve if I try to say no thank you to a drink. If I say straight up, no nah, thanks, I don't drink. They go and find me some sparkling water to put in my champagne glass, right? Yeah. They're cool. But if I try to say I don't eat sugar on Thanksgiving, they give me a hard time. Like I'm being ridiculous, right? Well, and nobody wants to talk about the fact, we've talked about this multiple times on different episodes about food not even being real anymore. A lot of the yeah. food that people are eating is not even food. Yeah. Right. It's not food. Right. Just because it's edible doesn't make it food. Well, <laughs> right. Well, it's right. the whole fat-free movement, right, that I think has also right. moved a lot of this faster, right? To get rid of the fat, we've just added a bunch more sugar. Yeah. And so yeah. it's making, so that, that's for another episode it, yeah. that we're yeah. going to do in, in a little bit about sugar addiction. But let, let's get back to the holidays because I think it's a very relevant point, right? That I, And I, you know, I'm not shy about it. I smoked for 20 years. I was very unhealthy. I quit smoking mm. close to five years ago. Anybody that knows me now, like, would never judge. You know, when I say, no, I don't smoke or anything like that, they're not going to try to push a cigarette mm -hmm. on me. That would be absurd, mm -hmm. right? Same thing with somebody who drinks or you say, no, I don't drink or I'm sober. It would be absurd for you to push a drink on that person. Yeah. But we'll push sugar. Yeah. We'll push Food. cake. We'll yeah. push crap on yeah. people without without any second thought. Without even knowing we're doing it. And a lot it. of times yeah. it's, you know, it's ant you know, right. Jane that's 50 totally. pounds overweight well, is pushing it on you not a, that's not healthy and totally. you're over here trying to get healthy, yeah, but totally. it makes her feel like crap mm -hmm. because you're drawing a line in the sand and you're trying yeah. to be healthy and it's like, oh no, well, if I'm going to be unhealthy, I want to bring everybody down with me. And a lot of, of what I do and what I, you know, in the bright line eating approach that I teach is I help people navigate those social situations with their families, with the Aunt Jane who has baked something, you know, gluten free and or, you know, whatever at a spelt flour and agave syrup or whatever. And she's handing you these baked goods and she's like, I know you're on a special thing. And, and we're like, I'm, you know, I'm not going to eat it. So how do you language that to her? Right. How do you get through the 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 family, you know, because um, breaking bread together is a very primal thing, right? And how do you keep your relationships intact? How do you stay close to the people that you want to be close to? I mean, Jonathan, so, okay, so right here, right? I'm, I'm in your home. And last night we were on the phone and I said, let's talk a little bit about the food for tomorrow. Cause I just went to Whole Foods and I got all my food. I've got enough food to like get my dinner for tomorrow. And you're like, well, I got this and that and the other. And now I have a choice point of like, am I going to eat what you're serving? Am I going to break bread with you in your home eating your food? And I decided to because you were you told me what you were serving and it was like, you know, foods I eat, right? Um, but there is this sort of dance, this negotiation that has to happen when you decide to swim upstream from society's expectations around food and not go with the healthy, with the unhealthy flow of like the not even food products that everybody yeah. else is eating. Right. You decide you're only going to eat whole real food in whatever way you want to spin that. And there are relationships to navigate. And through the holidays, that is a thing. Like yeah. if you want to be healthy through the holidays, which not everybody even tries to be, we just started this episode talking about like most people just don't even try. Right. right. I, but yeah. I try, like, I don't, I don't just go with that flow. Yeah. I'm, I'm not eating a pumpkin pie on Thanksgiving. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting when you say navigate the relationship with other people, you also have a relationship with yourself and what you owe to right. yourself. And it's funny, I wanted to touch on something when he talked about having a smoking addiction, you know, one of the, the addictions that is the hardest to break is the sugar addiction. We don't talk about that <laughs> enough. There's all these addictions, but there's research and information behind yeah. the fact that sugar addiction is one of the most powerful addictions. Yeah. So not only do you have to honor yourself and your relationship with yourself, but it's like, then you're right. How do you navigate the relationship? with other people but mm -hmm. put yourself first because it is a very primal thing it's a cultural thing 
And then how do you tell people no when yeah. it comes to what they're eating and serving you? That's, oh my God. It's a, it's Damn, such there's a so tough many ways thing. I could go with that. Totally. Um, well, first of all, one of the approaches that I share with people is, um, yeah, think about your commitment to yourself. Such a good point. And um, put it to yourself this way. If I were really allergic to peanuts, I mean like I eat a peanut and now I've just signed up for an EpiPen shot and a ride in an ambulance to the hospital. Like no joke. And Aunt, what was her name? Jane. Aunt Jane. Let's call has, her that. Has Sorry if anybody me. out there is Aunt Jane. This is not personal. <laughs> not about you. We're going to have the writer at the end of the movie credits. Like, no real people. Will exactly. We, we, <laughs> exactly. Um, so Aunt Jane has baked you peanut butter cookies. It doesn't effing matter, right? It's You find a way to language it. Aunt Jane, I don't eat that. I, I'm not eating that, right? Like, I know you just went out of your way. You baked them just for me, et cetera, et cetera. I'm allergic to peanuts. Um, you know, there is no world in which you decide, well, she baked him for me because I'll have one. So I'm right? just going to eat it and make right? myself sick. Yeah, exactly. Potentially die. From exactly. Eating right. Yeah. So it's right. like I say, show up with your identity that firmly entrenched, the identity of someone who doesn't eat that stuff. And suddenly it becomes easy. You find the words, right? It doesn't matter how much Aunt Jane wants you to eat that. You find the words. It, it's really interesting because when it comes to cigarettes, and I quit cold turkey, and I, I think that's the best way to do it. Can I give perfect. you a high five? Thank you. Cigarettes have been... Whoa. Whoa. There goes the mic. There goes the mic. Cigarettes <laughs> have been the bane of my existence, too. I feel you. <laughs> so when I quit, you know, it, it was... There's just no question, right? Like it never even... And of course, you know, you go through a process of breaking free and, and you think Changing about Changing your less identity. Less. It's right. an identity thing. Now at this point in time, I mean, I wouldn't even consider... Uh, smoking a cigarette it has yeah. nothing you know what i mean like there's just no it's a bright line that's the term sure. bright line and bright there, line yeah there, there's no uh situation that yeah. would make me do that right but i still struggle with food right i yeah. struggle with sugar i love sugar yep. right and i and i have an addictive personality clearly so i love sugar and you know it's just interesting and i can do really well at times but then there's times all right let's have a cheat day right or it is christmas that language right there cheat day exactly so it's it's just interesting as we talk about this because and I gotta quit being so animated too. I'm gonna knock over all these mics. Breaking um, all the rules. It's just it's interesting. And this is why I love having you on as a guest. This is why we love doing this podcast, because I'm not perfect, Terry Ann's not perfect, none of us are perfect, right? We're just figuring out how to be healthy together. Yeah. So everybody and that's at home, different for everyone too. Exactly. It is. Everybody different for has everyone. different fights or different struggles. And it would just be interesting if I treated sugar the way I treat cigarettes, yep. it would be very different. That's so let's, how I treat it. Let's segue yeah. into right. bright line eating on that. I think that yeah. was a great, a great touch point there. You said when he said I wouldn't smoke a cigarette ever again, you said that's a bright line. So yeah. talk about that a little bit and and explain what you mean by that either in relation to not smoking a cigarette anymore, but also in relation to yeah. food sugar. Choices. Yeah, yeah food totally. Choices. So bright lines are clear, unambiguous, unambiguous boundaries that you just don't cross, right? Like, Jonathan, you don't smoke. Right. Doesn't matter if it's New Year's Eve. Doesn't matter if you're at a concert. Doesn't matter if you're with 10 people and they're all smoking. Right. You don't smoke. And why, why do you call it bright line? Um, it's just, a, it's the name for it. So a bright line is a legal term. A bright line rule in the law is a clear standard that gets applied the same way every time to produce consistent and reliable results. And, um, so that's some, if you Wikipedia it, that's what comes up is something from the law and psychologists, uh, some time ago started co-opting that phrase to describe the psychological boundaries that some people put up between themselves and whatever, right? A bright line rule as opposed to a fuzzy boundary. So um, if you're gonna be the designated driver for the night, um, you will be, research shows, there's research on this, you will be far more successful if you put up a bright line for alcohol for the night. I'm not gonna drink tonight. As opposed to walking into the party and thinking, I'm gonna be sure to drink moderately tonight and make sure that I'm safe to drive. Because um, you never know which side of the line you're on with a fuzzy boundary like uh have i just had a beer and a half and it's 8 30 p.m am i you know am i drinking moderately enough right with a bright line rule it's clear you've had a drink or you haven't full stop right makes perfect sense so um what here's what i know about bright lines and food the more um addictable your brain is when it comes to food um the more helpful and even I would say necessary bright lines are going to be for you to um, 
uh, be healthy in this current food environment. We have a crazy food environment around us where um, the cues and opportunities to eat foods that will result in you being fat, sick, and unhealthy are uh, everywhere. They're just endless. Endless. Everywhere you go. Right? Every corner, there's totally. food to eat. Yeah. Every place in your house, there's food to eat, snacks. Yeah. And we live in a world full of snacks, snacks and more <laughs> and we snacks. We did not evolve to handle that, right? Yeah. We no. evolved to handle a world of scarcity and like eat the calories uh, when they're there, right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, our brains did not like, we're, are there really no match for this? And so we're having to like put up structures and safeguards to like keep ourselves healthy in this environment. It's a bizarre environment for a human, you know, creature to find him or herself in, right? So um, really what's important to understand is that there's a continuum of susceptibility to food addiction and to the pulls of these foods. Some people find themselves regulating just fine in the face of this environment. They, they have the no thank you kind of brain where it's like, yeah, I've had enough. Oh, that's too sweet. Oh, that's a little too rich. Oh, I feel full. Um, no, I'm just not thinking about food for a few hours because I just ate. What, I don't need any more food. That, that's how their brains are. Then there's those of us whose brains are like, oh, yeah, baby, that's good. Like, we're having some more of that. And, like, the stomach is saying, I feel kind of full, but the brain and the mouth are like, no, we're eating some more. Like well, especially if it's a cheat day, right? I mean, that, that, that's how I, like, seriously, that's how I feel for me. And it's interesting because we're not going to be home on Christmas, so I celebrated Christmas yesterday with my daughters. Uh -huh. And it was one of those days for me. So I'm talking real time, real world, you know, what happens. And, yeah. it's, and, and it's true. Like, I was, I was full last night. I didn't uh -huh. need to eat anymore, but... Man, there's still some but of those. You did. Yeah, some of those Reese's, you know, little miniature peanut butter cups that yeah. were in their stocking, or some some other candy. And it's like, well, this is my only day because tomorrow I'm, you know, I'm gonna go run four miles in the morning and be back on keto and all this other stuff. And it's just interesting. But I just kept stuffing myself, even though I was not hungry. Do you know that that's exercise bulimia? It's what? Exercise bulimia. Talk about that. Well, you just said like that your brain had some sort of relationship some connection between the four miles you were about to run and the permission to eat a bunch of food that your body didn't need. That's exercise bulimia. That's like, I'm going to work it off, right? It's the equivalent of a purge. Like, sure. you know, I'm going to get rid of it. Well, I normally run three, but I knew this morning I was running four because <laughs> I had extra you calories just your point even more. Boom, baby. Absolutely. You just oh, absolutely. Your point even more. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So the bright line is like for those of us, and I have like the most addictable brain in the world, apparently, like, I, I have a history of, we didn't go into my background, but um, addiction, like straight up crystal meth addiction, crack cocaine addiction. So you need addiction. that bright line. Can and, I ask a question around that with yeah. addiction? Yeah. Can people have more addictive personalities than others? I think there's a simple yes. answer to that, but talk a little bit about that. So it's like, yes. It's a simple answer. Every, yes. I think everyone knows the answer, but talk about that, especially yeah. when it comes to holidays and eating food and sugar. So there's research on this and um, some um, creatures... Human beings, rodents, there's research on all kinds of species around it are addictable and some are not. And there's a continuum. Like, And it, it actually, interesting, falls out in both human populations and rodent populations where there's a lot of research on this. One third, one third, one third, where one third are not addictable. They're just not. And I mean like you give them heroin daily for weeks. And nothing. Yeah. And like, they can stop. And then no, they no stop issue. and they're yeah. like, oh, ugh, I'm so glad to be off that. I used to have friends that smoked. Yeah. Right. And I was like, oh, I'm just a social smoker. Like, right. well, that was my excuse. I just hang out with people all the time. Right? <laughs> but for them, they really did. Right. They could have two yeah. cigarettes on a Sunday and yeah. be fine till next month. And I'm like, exactly. to How me, though, that? that's like if I have one, I might as well have a pack. Totally. Me yeah. too. Um, so one third are not addictable. One third are moderately addictable. And one third are heavily, highly addictable. And um, and then another layer to this research is that... Um, just because you're addictable doesn't mean you are currently in a state of addiction with all things that are addictable. So me, for example, I've, I've been thinking lately, like, what, have I, what am I not addicted to? Shopping, gaming, gambling. Um, those are things that are addictable, like gaming. Oh my gosh, some people are like wasting their lives away playing whatever these, I don't even know the names of the games, whatever. Like I could sit down and play a video game and walk away. Be and, like, that was me fine. 20 years ago. Yeah. Love the game. I, I'm very addictable personality. And so, yeah. but it's interesting. Yes, I used to game a whole lot. Yeah. Right. And same even with drinking and with smoking. Yeah. Now I'm not addicted to gaming. I'm uh -huh. not addicted to gambling. Not addicted to smoking anymore. 
Yeah. Probably still semi-addicted to food. Okay, but okay, right? let's go back to smoking. Right. Um, just because you're not smoking right now doesn't mean you're not addicted to smoking. Your brain has walked far down the path with the smoking cues, which means you are in a state right now where one cigarette, you might as well buy a pack. You just said it. Sure. Yeah. Right? So you are addicted to smoking. You're in a state of um, abstinence or remission. Okay. So that's different from maybe, I don't know what, shopping? Have you never done the shopping thing? No, no, ever? No. The or, gaming, I was never addicted to games. Like if I go play a video game now, I'm, you're not going to find me yeah. 30 hours later playing yeah. the same game. So okay. I'm, I'm good with that. But yes, yeah, so I guess I was just trying to understand. So there's different states. There's, right. there's addicted and in an active state of currently using got it there's like used to be addicted and i'm in a state of abstinence or recovery or you know um whatever and then there's like my uh, uh the other one is like no my brain has never developed the the noticing of like oh yeah that'll do like that thing produces a hit like if we're in distress or need relief or whatever like we could go there and get the hit we need. If your brain's never noticed it with that particular set of um, cues, um, then uh, if you're an addictable person, it's available to you, but if but you're in a state of sort of protection around it. You can kind of dabble, and until your brain notices, like, that was a good hit. Um, maybe in a time of stress in your life or whatever, right? Addictions develop through the brain kind of noticing that. And then, and then you develop these cue response behaviors and addiction takes a while to develop and it develops within a domain, the smoking domain, the drinking domain, the food domain. Like, you know, you go to AA and there's people who, yeah, they were hardcore alcoholics, but they're pretty neutral around food. Like foods never really rung their bell. They just kind of never noticed, but then they go through a divorce later on and they get through it with with one pound bag of M&Ms and suddenly food becomes an issue, right? So there's a layering of like susceptibility and then um, environmental history with the with the cues and experiences of that particular substance. That's interesting because I've heard it, well, and to take it one step further, I've, I've had a lot of friends who have had um, problems with addiction and drug addiction and things like that. And it's when you look at their lives, then they'll turn to something else to be yes. addicted to. Right. It's like, I can't be addicted to this, but they have that addictive personality. And yeah. It's like, how do you ever break that cycle? Because it's an ongoing battle. Yeah. I and mean, when you talk about the one third, one third, one third, talk about the holidays for a minute. It's like going back to that and eating. You kind of notice that pattern with people too when you're eating at the holidays or there's a lot of food around. Some people are just like, I don't want sugar. It doesn't do anything yeah. for me. And some people are like, I'll just have a little bit and that's all I need. And then there's, you know, I want to eat all the sugar. Yeah. But it's like, you know, people go from who are, have very addictive personalities, you'll notice that with people. They have this addiction, but they're like, I don't want this addiction. It's a bad addiction, but it transfers yeah. into other things. Addiction transfers and, a very real thing. Yes. And around the holidays, like, um, it, it's so it can feel like whack-a-mole, right? Like there's this, you know that game where there's like the little groundhog that pops yep. up or whatever, you smack them on the head, but then what happens is one just pops up somewhere else. Mm. If you're if you're highly addictable, sometimes it can feel like that. It's, it's so like many things to be addicted to. You stamp to. out one and yeah. then another one pops yeah. up. The issue yeah. there is in the brain, it's dopamine downregulation. So in the addictive centers of the brain, you've basically blown out the dopamine receptors. So they've become less numerous, less responsive um, through just getting flooded. Just numb. Unnaturally. Yeah. yeah. So just be, do whatever I want now. Yeah. Just everything I see, food, shopping. And know, what happens is you take away any um, like crazy intense stimulus and you just don't have enough dopamine on board anymore naturally to feel okay. So you need to kind of go get something. Like your brain is kind of constantly in a state of, I need a little something because yeah. like I feel pretty bleak, pretty itchy, pretty like not okay. And then and what happens with your emotions at that point, right? Because that's going to impact, you, you're going through that phase of like, I need to find something, find something, all this addiction going on around you, all these things you can be addicted yeah. to. And when you're at the holidays, especially, we talk about the emotional impact. Yeah. And you this, know? This, the family stress and all these yeah. extra, the financial stress, the extra tasks you got to do on your to-do yeah. list, you know, that are added to an already busy life and stuff. Yeah. It, it is this feeling of, I, I mean, I just said it, kind of bleak, itchy. Um, not okay. It's something that people who have never been heavily addicted to anything don't really understand, which is that the addict isn't using to get high after a certain point. They're using to get normal. They're using to get relief, comfort, back to baseline. I think that's a really important thing to say again, right? <laughs> because listen, I, I, I have been addicted and I am addicted, 
yeah. right? To to things, a lot of things, right? Yeah. We haven't gone into my history either, but there's other things that, that go down that line as well. And not everybody understands that. They don't yeah. understand that that cigarette, that drink, that line, that hit, that whatever, that isn't always you. just to get high. Yeah. It's just to get back to freaking normal. Yeah. Right? And 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 you just need it. Yeah. And it's and to bring things back to to the holidays, it feels like to me, and yes, holidays are wonderful and I love what they stand for and I love being around family and I love that love, but I think at the same time it opens up Pandora's box to re-engage all of these addictions that you may have broken in the past or to, you know what I mean whether it's a food addiction or smoking or whatever because of the stress or maybe you're addicted to shopping now it's time to go buy presents for everybody or all of these different things now get opened up during the holidays right and and this yeah. is what I want to talk about right now because right now it's December 26 right it's the day after Christmas how many people are now hung over on the yeah. holidays are just now, you know, listening to this, maybe going on their bulimic run or, or something <laughs> else, right? But they're but they see the they see January first ahead, yeah. And it's like crap. I smoked. Crap. I ate a bunch of shit. I'm done. I'm tired. I'm fed up. It's time to make a difference, yeah. right? The first is coming up. Let's talk about where people are right now as they listen to this, yeah. And let's talk about how to powerfully move forward into the new year. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and maybe create some bright lines, create some just some different distinctions, because I, I think we could talk all day long about addiction and we are going to do an episode just on sugar addiction. But I really want to connect with people where they are in this moment. Yeah. Right. And they've gone to the parties. They've eaten the pumpkin pie already. They've already said, OK, crap, yeah. I already I already did all that. Now tell me what do I do now? Well, and, and let's not miss the step, too, that some people aren't even at that point They're When I talk about the emotions and the addiction, they're coming down off of that high or even just the normal back to a lower point of like, I, I messed it all up. I messed it all up. And I think that it's easy to the fall depression into that depression. Is setting at the in, yeah, yeah, the depression absolutely. is setting in from the choices Before that you made. Before you even get to the goal point, I think a lot of people are dealing with that after effect of how you yeah. feel. And it's interesting in the holidays because it, it, you know, it's December 26th now, but it can, that can hit at any point, you know, it might hit after the, the company party on December 9th, you sure. know, maybe it hit already after Thanksgiving, but you know, the foods, foods have such a profound impact on our emotional state. You eat a bunch of crap and you feel like crap. I mean, like sugar makes you depressed. It makes you, um, uh, a little bit like um, you know, that state of mind after you didn't sleep the night before and your head starts talking smack to you, like, you know, you're, you're like, this is desperate. My relationship's got to go. It's all wrong. You know, this is off. This is off. I got to quit my job, you know, whatever. And then this higher voice comes in and says, you know what? You got like two hours of sleep last night. Why don't you get a good night's sleep and think about all this tomorrow, right? The the sugar and the the crappy junk food that we load ourselves up with during the holidays, it creates that. It creates this sort of unnatural negativity, desperation. Um, it, in in some cases, it goes more toward um, self loathing. Um, you know, really negative self talk. You know, God, you do it again. You know, you're so worthless, stupid, you know, hopeless. The um, So I like to talk a lot at, um, about self-compassion and about how we talk to, how we language this kind of stuff to ourselves, um, which is a whole separate topic. But anyway. Um, well, let's it, talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Talk, talk about that for yeah. a second. Absolutely. Because this, yeah. this is where everybody is right now as they listen to this. I mean, and not everybody, right? But a lot, yeah. a lot of us right now are in that state. Yeah. Right. And how are we talking to ourselves? What's the narration that's going on in our head? Yeah. Because it matters. It does matter. It does yeah. matter. And it's it's um, one of the things that matters most to me, actually, in my mission in the world is to um, help people. Well, who've had weight problems and problems with food addiction to learn how to do it entirely differently the whole food thing right and um, how to live in a right-sized body after you've been overweight or obese and how to um, experience the mental shift also which involves far more self-compassion than people realize um, self-compassion is an interesting topic it uh, from an academic perspective um, the first scientific article on self-compassion I believe came out in 2005 
uh, I say that with about an 80% confidence interval. Mm -hmm. Um, but what happened is, um, articles started to get published on it and then they exploded. Like, uh, so many articles now are being published on self-compassion. It's one of the hottest topics in psychology. And it's really recent. I mean, really 2005, recent. that's, that's like yesterday. Well, what's interesting right? is of all the articles that have been published, like, uh, most of them have been published in the last two years, like three years. Uh, oh. like there's this exponential. Do you think that has explosion. to do with people being more open to the conversation around mental health and talking about it more and being more open about it? Because I think that has a lot to do Maybe. with our, you know, being self-compassionate and feeling that compassion. Yeah. It's more about opening that conversation about telling people where you really are and not being afraid to talk about it. And I think we're making that more socially acceptable to yeah. share where you are. And I think it makes it easier to have compassion for yourself when you realize you're not alone. Y yes. So I'll, I'll get into the definition of self-compassion. That's part of the definition actually right there. Um, I think, I think what actually happened in the academic sense is that, um, the construct turned out to be, uh, ridiculously powerful and, and it just kind of blew scientists away. So mm -hmm. if you look at, so, um, the equivalent was like in the 1970s and 80s, self-esteem as a construct came on the scene and it turned out to be pretty powerful. Like if you me measure self-esteem, it turns out to correlate with all these, you know, like high self-esteem and at-risk teens uh, predicts, you know, less likelihood of getting involved with drugs, more likelihood of graduating from high school, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. Uh, and then like a couple decades later, this construct of resilience came in and that turns out to be a really powerful construct self-compassion blows them all away. Like someone's ability to be compassionate with themselves when they blow it, when they perceive themselves to have effed up, um, is a better predictor of success in every way than anything we've ever measured. And self-compassion in and of itself accounts for about half of um, our tendency toward depression and anxiety. Like. So define it, define yeah. self-compassion so that, so that we are all on the same page yeah. moving forward. Cause this is important. It's so important. Three things. Self-compassion is three things. Number one is how you talk to yourself inside your own head. I love that you're taking notes cause it's, this is such important stuff. Like, are you kind to yourself? Like when you blow it, um, like let's imagine that, um, you forgot to pick your daughter up from school and she sat there for two hours, like. Nobody likes, oh, like, what? It was my turn to pick up Sarah from school? <sighs> right? Like, you just blew it. There's no world in which you didn't just blow it. Like, that yeah. was a, you know, drop that ball, right? And your kid tells you you blew it. Yeah. How, How, why'd you make me stay here for two hours? Totally, right? Yeah. How do you yeah. talk to yourself inside your own head, right? You fucking idiot. Like, here you are. Like, you know, like, or is it like, you know, oh, wow. Um, and, you know, do you sort of, um, yeah, how do you language that inside your own head? Do you beat yourself up? So if so, the, the way to sort of test this is, do you talk to yourself like you would actually talk to your best friend about something? Or do you talk to yourself uh, in a way that's meaner, harsher um, than you would ever talk to anyone? Like, like people who, who say yes to statements like, um, if anyone ever talked to me the way I talk to myself, I would kick them out of my life forever. There are people who will tick that box. Like, yeah, that's true of me. I, I am more mean to myself than I would ever let anyone else be to me. Um, I would, I, I would be, I would guess that that's probably a majority of people, right? That, that talk, and, and I don't know the numbers, right? Yeah. But I would imagine anybody that's dealing, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know that most people are as compassionate with themselves as they could be. There you go. And, and I yeah. think that society sets us up for failure around that, right? I mean, we talk about social media and Facebook and things like that, where all you're seeing is the pretty pictures of your yeah. friends, the doctored pictures of your friends. Right. They're only sharing the good shit in their life, right? right? So now all of a sudden you're depressed even more because you're on Facebook and you're comparing yourself to their lives. And now you're being even crappier to yourself, right? Yeah. So I, I, I just would imagine that we're going further and further down that line of being less compassionate with ourselves because of all the comparison and all the other stuff that's yeah, out there. Yeah, it definitely there. doesn't help. It definitely right. doesn't help. The second component of self-compassion is um, uh, recognizing your humanity, your shared humanity in the moment of like, um, like so you, you forgot to pick up your daughter from school, right? Like in that moment, recognizing 
every parent blows it. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm one of, you know, the legions of parents who have had, you know, uh, times when they've dropped the ball on their kids. Right. Uh, as opposed to thinking that you're like, that you're the first person in the history of parenting who's ever, you know, drop the ball on their kid, right? So rec in that moment, literally recognizing your shared humanity and that you're one of many, not a special instance. The third com uh, component of self-compassion is, um, it, it, it's kind of hard to describe. It's like, um, it's like being mindful in the moment so you can rally resources for yourself. It's like thinking, okay, I just, it's like, it, it's almost like a meditative thing, but it's like, okay, so here I am. I just learned that I dropped the ball on Sarah. Let's go get her, first of all. <laughs> and then, you know, let's, um, can I wipe something off my calendar for later so I can spend some extra time with her tonight and just check in with her? And um, maybe I might need to talk on the phone with a friend tonight as well to get some emotional support. And like, it's sort of like a, a mindful presence, like a, um, can you turn yourself into the switchboard operator who's rallying resources, aware of the present moment, and like um, able to sort of care for yourself in that moment. Um, but, so but it requires it, mindfulness. So is it, yeah, is it being mindful? Is it... Is it stepping back and, and just having perspective of it? Yeah. Or, and I'm just asking for yes. clarity so that I understand it yeah. more. And, you know, getting perspective or is it solution based? Is it okay? Like being mindful is okay. Here's what I'm going to put in place so that that doesn't happen in the future. Or is that not it? It's so mindfulness. It's mindfulness in the moment. And that mindfulness allows a lot of things. It allows for perspective. It allows for rallying resources. Um, it's like, um, if you go, it's like, if you go right into reactionary mode, reaction mode, as opposed to response mode, you're just not going to navigate the situation as well, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to language, but it's mindfulness. In yeah, get, and and I and and I'm, yeah, I'm not trying to to put you on the spot too much, but I I really want people to understand this because I think that this is, this is the part that is going to change them right now in the moment on how they're feeling yeah. today. Yeah. Right after Christmas, after eating, after <clears throat> breaking their bright lines. Yeah. Right. Totally. So, what are some other things just to really understand that number three being well? Mindful. And I have a, and, a clarifying question too. Because Jonathan touched on this just a little bit, but are you, when you're in that state of trying to find self-compassion, in that being mindful, are you thinking about next time this happens, it won't happen because I'm putting this in place. Also, while you're thinking about, I need to talk to someone, I need support, I want to just feel good around this situation because, you know, I'm human and I'm going to be compassionate to myself. That's, I need that clarity of like, Agreed, right? That you, mindfulness isn't being forgiveness. It's not... You, we're not talking about forgiving yourself. We're not talking about or trying creating to find a, plan, a solution. Or creating, creating a, plan. a plan or solution. What is but that? I think mindful? forgiveness could be part of it. Isn't that self compassion? Is saying other people, that's kind of the humanity part. That's like, the humanity part. That's the humanity yeah. part. It's like other people have done this too. I am, mm -hmm. there's billions of people on this planet. I'm not the only one that did this, right? Yeah. Other people have done that. I think. And you can speak to that, but that would make sense to me that the forgiveness part comes in there, right? Yeah, Where let me put this that. in a different domain because I think it'll be easier to recognize in a different domain. Perfect. Imagine you're arguing with your spouse or significant other, right? If I said that a component to being, um, like to having a high emotional IQ, EQ, right? Uh, a high relational intelligence would be mindfulness. Like imagine you're arguing that mindfulness in that moment, it, it provides a lot of things. It provides a little bit of pause so that you're not like interrupting them. And, you know, it provides a little bit of perspective. You're not screaming at them as much. It provides, um, you know, if, if you bring mindfulness into that moment, do you see how it opens up a lot of um, just different types of responses, like an emotional flexibility because you're actually, you're showing up with your highest self there. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So with, well, without it, it, that, it's hard to be fully self-compassionate. It like, helps when you put it in perspective of your spouse or significant other or something like that. Because when you think about being mindful with them, it's like, all right, well, even though we're fighting, 
right? I'm not going to fight dirty. Yeah. Right. And that's different, right? Because we talk about, well, I wouldn't talk to my friend the way that I talk to myself. And so to me, the way that it occurred to me when you just said that was not fighting dirty with me. Exactly. Right. How to be mindful with me exactly. in when, when I'm being hard on myself. Exactly. Right? It's very easy for me to see it on my girlfriend or spouse to not be hard on them during a fight. Yeah. Right. Or fight dirty. But with me, I'll fight dirty all day long. Right. Right. So it, right. Uh, that to me gave a lot of clarity. Yeah. No, totally. <sighs> so now that we've defined self-compassion, let's talk a little bit more about self-compassion. Let's talk about are there tools, are there things that we can do in the moment? You know, I, I, we've talked about these three things of self-compassion, but how do we help break that cycle? How do we break that cycle of negative talk, right? Because right now, how many people are listening that are having that negative talk because of what they ate yesterday or because there's still, they're still leftover pie in the fridge, right? <laughs> and it's like, well, New Year's is coming in five days. I'll change then. Yeah. But between now and then, they're going to have a whole lot of, I call it narration, you know, how you talk to yourself, how you narrate a situation, whether it's to yourself or even verbally to somebody else. What, what are things that people can do even in the moment right now as we're on the backside of the holidays? Well, I mean, this is going to sound self-serving, but um, from my perspective, anyone who wants to um, uh, do right by themselves in the moment on December 26th or whatever. And, and it's, you know, around food, around weight, around, um, that hangover from having eaten, you know, their way through the holidays and just sort of been in that mode of indulgence. And I'm just going to take my comfort in food. It's like the best next right action is to hook up with a community of people who are living the way you want to live, who have an answer, who have a solution that you want to emulate and just join like hook up because there is no way i don't believe um to um succeed in this current food environment without doing that you gotta hook up you gotta be in a community it's it's sort of like um i often say um, getting into a right size body and living there long term, like solving the food issue. If you've got a food issue, not, not everybody does. Not everybody has a food and a weight issue. I get that. But uh, these days, most people do, statistically. Um, and if you want to solve that, if you want to give yourself the best odds of success, globally speaking, and even right now today, um, you, you, it, it behooves you to think of yourself as like wanting to climb Mount Everest. Because if you look around statistically, people are not solving this problem. They're turning over a new leaf and then failing over and over and over again. Our obesity rates are skyrocketing, even as most people are trying four and five times a year to solve the problem. Nothing is working out there. Um, trying harder than we've ever tried in the past. Trying harder right? than we've ever tried, tried in the past. And yet, um, the 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 statistics keep climbing. Like we are, as a society, we are out of control with our food and our weight. And um, so I'm sitting here in a right sized body. You guys have seen me, right? I look, you know, like a normal skinny person, right? And um, I used to be obese. I had a weight problem as a kid and I was overweight as a teenager and obese in my twenties. And I've been in a right sized body now for over 15 years. Um, statistically speaking, that doesn't happen. Nobody goes from obese to slender and stays there for 15 years. One one hundredth of one percent. I'll give you some on that one. Boom, baby. Yeah, you're smoking success. <laughs> exactly. Like that's me. Absolutely. Yeah. And not to say that it's been easy and you no, know, it has not. It's a thing. Um, but um I help people do that like an experienced guide who takes people up Mount Everest and back down with the best survival rate ever. Like People don't die on my watch. Some do, because no one takes, you know, thousands of people up Mount Everest and back down without losing some. So well, you they, can't choose for people. It's a choice they have to oh, make. Oh, totally. Yeah. I right? always say I'm not in the convincing business. No. <laughs> no, no, I am they not. They have to make that choice and want totally. it. Totally. But yeah. you got to hook up. Like you can't, this is not something that you can ta just think like, oh, I'm just going to buy the latest diet book at Barnes and Noble or on Amazon and like read it and succeed. Like if that worked, don't you think that people would be thin already? Seriously, 
it doesn't work. You no. got to find a different kind of solution. Let me, since this is your personal experience and we're talking about, you know, the holidays and food and things like that, and you've changed your life and you have control over your food and your body and things like that. I want to ask you two questions. First one is how did self-compassion help change your way of thinking for your own body and living in your right size body, if you will, for, for how you put it. And what were the top three changes you made that came from that self-compassion that led you to where you are today? Um, I think there was a lot of self-compassion in play in my just resilience, my willingness to just keep trying, uh, to just keep trying. Like, cause I, uh, I was a drug addict and that one got solved pretty quickly and easily for me. Like wicked drug addict, like, you know, prostitute living on the streets, crack cocaine addiction, you know, spending day upon night upon day upon night upon day upon night in a crack house, like drug addiction. And uh, when I was 20, um, I got clean and sober and I just, you know, just got removed. And um, I mean, not to say that was easy. That was, you know, getting recovery in that area took a lot. But um, the food thing, um, I just couldn't get it. I just kept trying to find a solution and my weight kept climbing. You know, I'd lose 20 pounds, 40 pounds, 50 pounds, and then gain it all back over and over again. And overall, my weights kept climbing. And then I was fatter and then I was fatter. I'd try something, lose some weight, then I was fatter. And um, I think a lot of people can relate to that, by the way. I think that's a really important, important part of your story. Yeah. I think and that's the struggle a lot of people go over through. Over the years, seeing those new peaks of weight, like, okay, now I'm in this decade of yeah. weight, you know, the whatever the weight is, right? The 200s, the 220s, the whatever the number is, yeah. right? Now I'm in this size. Okay, now I'm in this size. Yeah. Now I'm, but now my closet now has like 14 sizes of clothes <laughs> in it, you know what I mean? Because I never know what's going to fit on any given day, right? Um, and just, just that I kind of, um, hung in there by myself. You know what I mean? That I hung with myself and didn't give up on myself. Um, there are moments when I just decided, and I think most people who are like me have this phase where they think, I just need to accept myself fat. Like there is no answer to this. So I just need to accept that I'm just going to carry around a lot of weight. And how do I make myself as attractive, feel as attractive as I can at this size and settle in to my my identity as a heavy person, you know? Um, and then the day comes where it's like, no, I need to try to get this weight off again. Okay. Back, back to square one, looking for an answer, you know? So I don't, I forget your question had multi, you know, well, layers, so I think the next like, part is really important. So that was just your self-compassion. And I think for you, self-compassion is going to look different for everyone. But for you, it sounds to me like a lot of it was like, get back in the ring, keep fighting. You can do it. You can do it. And I think that's different for everyone, but it sounds like that's what you were telling yourself. Like you can yeah. keep doing it. You can keep going. Yeah. So the second part, and I actually think this applies to everyone coming out of the holidays with the physical and emotional aspect. What were three things that you really did to put yourself on a course where you changed your life. And I think coming out of the holidays, this can be really meaningful for people too, because obviously yeah. you made some big shifts. I did. Yeah. Um, I was on the lookout for a solution actively for a long time. And, um, a lot of what turned into bright line eating came, it, it, you know, bright line eating came from a couple places. Well, really three places, but one is the 12 step food movement. Um, I got clean and sober in 12 step programs. And then I was looking for a solution to my food addiction in 12 step programs. And, um, ultimately I, um, I, it's hard to say whether I found it there or not. I, I found it well enough. It, um, but I kept looking for people like the guide who takes people up Mount Everest successfully. I kept looking for people who had done what I wanted to do, who used to have a food and a weight problem like I did. Cause if they haven't, you know, there's them saying, oh, just do, 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 you know, it's like, well, dude, you've always been skinny. You have no clue. Yeah. You, you know, know what know I mean? It. Like if you, if you haven't done the equivalent of like making a bowl of cookie dough and sneaking off to the bathroom to eat it or whatever, like your version of like, I I'm going to eat a whole pizza now, or I'm going to like, whatever. Right. If you don't have that kind of food problem, your brain doesn't work like mine. Like I need a potent solution, not just some kind You found your group. Like you talked about earlier, yeah. like you found people that you could relate to and keep you strong. I did. Yeah. And I'm not in a 12 step food program anymore. Um, ultimately I, 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 um, 
you know, I found a bright line eating and I, I, there's lots of reasons why I think that it, um, it solves for me what were unsolved issues in those communities. But, um, so I, I kept looking I, and I joined up, i I formed my posse. I found my tribe. Um, and I also, you know, one of the things that I baked into bright line eating is like, um, the science, you know, you got to understand why your brain has done this to you. Like, why, like for me, I could do anything. I ran a marathon. I got a PhD in brain and cognitive sciences at one of the top schools in the world. Um, I was happily married. I had a lot of friends. Um, and I, and I couldn't, and I kicked crack cocaine. You know, I had a lot of evidence that I had some capacity on board and some, you know, badassery and lots of domains, but I couldn't solve the food and the weight problem. And I think understanding that, um, finally, like, why is this problem particularly intractable for so many people? Um, a lot of what I do teaches the science of that, which I think is really helpful, but you're asking for specific things. I mean, I, I'm going to be like, I'm going to be totally self-serving, but honest join bright line eating. Like it's the only solution that I know out there that has any kind of track record. So let's talk about that being the bright line eating Sherpa <laughs> right? that you are. Yeah. Right. And let's talk about it because I know that, and there's no worries being self-serving. I mean, this is why we're having you on the podcast because we want to help a lot of people that are out there listening. Yeah. Right. And we're not going to be able to solve everything in a 45 minute or one hour long podcast. There's more that needs to be done. There's more that you can share. Yes, we're having you on for a few episodes in a row. So everybody that's listening in, make sure you tune back in for the other ones. Let's talk about bright line eating. Let's talk about where people can go right now online. You're also, I know that you're currently running a video series, Reboot Resume, yeah. that's 100% free yep. for people to watch as well. Yep. So there, there's more here to this story. Let's give people some resources right now, and then let's talk a little bit more about Brightline. So first, will you give us some URLs that people can go to to learn more about Brightline Eating? Yeah, sure. So um, the first thing is no know where your brain is on that that addictive food susceptibility spectrum right so go to foodfreedomquiz.com okay. foodfreedomquiz.com take the quiz it's a scale from one to ten i'm a ten dude you're a ten i'm sure i'm a ten <laughs> <laughs> i don't know why you turn that part, but we I, it's secret 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 yeah i'm not gonna give that away okay um but yeah so go find out what kind of brain you have because if like you're a two on that scale you don't you know you could do bright line eating if you have a weight issue and you just want to get off x number of pounds bright line eating is ridiculously effective at helping people lose weight um but um and that's fine we have people who are lower on the scale and just use it as a weight loss solution they just want to know like just tell me what to eat and how much and when and i just want some clarity around my food that um, would totally be me. I really would be at that lower end of the spectrum. It's really not yeah. a secret. I would never think to find myself up at a 10. Uh -huh. Yeah. That would be me. But then if you got a weight problem and a food addiction problem, like um, you're in a you're in a coffin with the nails like, you know, pounding in and you hear them, you know, like because you try other stuff and it's like kind of works for a little while and then you watch it unravel over and over and over again. So uh i lost my place what, what okay good. so Give food, URLs, food right? freedom quiz food freedom quiz and then By the, brightline eating.com b-r-i-g-h-t-l-i-n-e bright line it's two words yep but on in the url it's all smushed together right bright sure. brightline eating.com and then there's the book you know you could get that but the food the the ser the video series that's going on um <laughs> you're gonna laugh at me jonathan because um I'm like you are, I'm sure I don't actually know how all the tech works. You know, like I'm pretty sure if uh -huh. someone takes the quiz, they'll be in some kind of email sequence that'll <laughs> to like get that. offer them a video <laughs> series or whatever. It's not available like just on the website or whatever. So yeah. Here's another thing that people can do. Go to empoweringyouorganically.com because we will have all the show notes. We'll have transcriptions. Obviously, you can watch the video here and we'll have links to all of your sites yeah, too. Yeah, perfect. So we'll have... Um, the video series food freedom right quiz there. we'll have brightlineeating.com there um also and for your video series and and understand if you know the video series is free right now but there is, it's it's up just for a limited time yeah so make sure don't pause right if you're listening yeah. to this and if you don't feel like you have a food addiction forward this podcast on to somebody that you know that does. You have one mission that you're on by yeah. 2030. yeah we want a, we want to get a million people. 
who are currently overweight or obese down into a right size body, like straight up slender, normal BMI, rock in their skinny jeans, whatever they want, you know, uh, and living there by 2030, 1 million people by 2030. So it's like 1 million at goal weight by 2030. And how many awesome. have gotten there so far? We don't know. We can't wait to find out. So it's on our strategic plan for <laughs> okay. 2019 to create the database. Cause like we, you know, we've got we thousands and thousands. I mean, oh, how many people have, I don't know, like 50,000 people have signed up for our programs and stuff. And since we've only been around for four years, um, really just three since we've been really cranking. Um, but, um, but then my book, like New York Times bestselling book, like it's every, it's in it's like fourth printing or something. It just came out last year. Awesome. Um, so, uh, we don't know. Cause I keep running into people. Aren't you Susan Pierce Thompson? I'm thin. I read your book. I watch your, you know, your weekly vlog online. It's like all this free stuff. And we got all these people out there who are rocking right size bodies with bright line eating. We don't even know who they are. They're not even in our system. We don't even have their email address. We got a million people on our email list, you know, who've given us their email address over the last three and a half four years um but we need to start um tracking the people who are at goal weight we haven't done that yet you know um bright line eating has been growing like hand over fist like we can't even keep up with the growth it's like it's it feels like giving birth honestly like i'm just like the contractions keep coming it's like okay well here's the next thing we got to do okay well here's the next thing like we have the most effective weight loss solution in the world, like by a lot, like 55 times more effective than any other method, getting people from obese to slender in one year. Um, so we're, yeah, so we don't know and we can't wait to find out we're gonna set up that database this year. It'll be awesome. Yeah. One thing you can talk we'll about though sure. is the success rate yeah. that you have, right? So you may not know how many people you've made successful, but how many people, cause, cause it, it matters. Listen, there's all kinds of fad diets and there's the keto and paleo and, yeah. you know, and vegan or vegetarian, yeah. or there's a new carnivore diet that people are doing now. And there's, you know, the cookie diet and the watermelon diet and all this other shit. Right. Yeah. So, and so, you know, I'm not knocking anybody if you're on that, right? Yeah. All of us are different. We all, yeah. you know, respond differently to different things. And most of those plans can be done with bright line eating actually, like not so the cookie then, diet. Then, then tell me what, what, <laughs> right? what is a bright line, then what is bright line eating? Yeah, um, and 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 then let's circle back around to success to, rates. Yes. So, um, bright line eating uh, is founded on four clear bright lines, which are again those clear boundaries: no sugar. Um, you can eat whole fresh fruit, but not anything with uh, sweetener added to it. So, no artificial sweetener, no natural like honey, agave, none of that. Like just no sugar, no no added sweetener. What about stevia, nope. erythritol? None Nothing of it. added to your food to make it sweeter. One of the connections um, that undoes us is actually straight from the taste buds up to the addictive centers of the brain. So stevia, even though blah 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 doesn't affect glucose, blah, but doesn't matter. It's hitting the 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 sweet taste buds on the tongue. Interesting. That's the issue. It triggers the addiction that way. Uh, so no sugar, no flour, all flour, doesn't matter. Stone ground, coconut flour, almond flour, doesn't matter. It's actually the um, the grinding down um, of the molecules, like the exposing of the molecules to the surface area of the digestive enzymes that makes it flood into the digestive system and hit the brain with a, whoosh, a wallop of dopamine um, that keeps the addiction alive. So no flour of any kind, no sugar, no flour, eating only meals, not snacking or grazing. So like you eat at mealtime and then every other bite of food is a no thank you. Doesn't matter if it's baby carrots and hummus out on the tray at three in the afternoon. It's a no thank you. You eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, nothing in between. And there's actually wiggle in terms of how many meals. Different people need different numbers of meals. Most people are best served by three meals a day at standard meal times, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and then quantities, uh, a way to bound the quantity of food. Because once you sort of put the first three bright lines in play, the brain will um, trick you into eating more, for some of us, uh, more roasted Brussels sprouts, more honey crisp apples, more butternut squash, whatever, to keep the weight higher than we want it to be, especially those last 10 pounds. You gotta be really clear on your quantities. So um, oftentimes we have people weigh their food with a digital food scale, mostly so they eat enough vegetables. They won't eat enough if they are not weighing it. So we give people very precise clarity around how much food to eat. Uh, it's more than they expect. Um, people don't go hungry on bright line eating and, uh, yeah. So sugar, flour, meals, and quantities. Those are the four bright lines. There's amazing support. It's a fully scientifically grounded, psychological, behavioral, uh, program that it's a whole system. Like it works in a very integrated, 
comprehensive way. It's not just a food plan. What we do in Bright Line Eating is um, we handle the problem of, um, of execution, longevity, um, and compliance over the long term. Because the real issue is not like, what are you going to eat or not eat? The real issue is, how are you still going to be doing it a year from now? Lifestyle. That's the issue. It's a lifestyle, yes. not just a small change. And and I talk so much about what that means. When you say you, you got to change your lifestyle, it's not a diet. Fully embracing what it. What does that mean? And changing everything. Mm-hmm. Your house, in your house, out of your house, where you're going, pre- being prepared. Here's yeah. what lifestyle yeah. means. It's three things. These are the essentials of a lifestyle change, not a diet change. It's essential as AIR. A-I-R. That's the acronym. A is for automaticity. You got to make your new behaviors and habits so ingrained that they're automatic, like brushing your teeth. And the reason that's so important is because willpower will fail you. You cannot rely on your willpower to be executing under stress. You can for the first three days, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> and or then three after days that, or whatever. Absolutely. But then, then when over. the shit hits the fan, you know, yeah. what I mean? it's got you know. So think about how you brush your teeth. It's like you keep brushing your teeth even when your spouse is in the hospital because it's it's triggered by a certain time of day, a certain location, a certain you know pat. That's how you got to be weaving in your eating. Now you leave yourself on your own recognizance to set that up. You'll fail, but take my hand. I'll teach you how to set that up so that your eating is happening automatically. The right thing to eat is the easiest thing to eat is the thing you are eating no matter the conditions. So automaticity, identity, like you, Jonathan, are a non-smoker. Right. Deep. Right. Deep. Doesn't matter the situation you're in. Absolutely. You got to become someone who is a certain kind of eater, bright line eater, a bright liner or whatever, like a healthy eater, however you want to language it to yourself. It's not, no, I can't eat that because it's not on my diet. No, it's like, no, thank you. I don't eat that. I don't eat that. Like I don't smoke, right? Identity. And then the third one is resume. You have to have a, a flexibility and a way of getting back on track because nobody's perfect, right? Like perfection is not available for human beings living on planet earth. And anyone who's naturally slender, like you, Terry Ann, you are resuming back to a certain level of healthy eating naturally, right? Like when you veer, yes, when you veer, don't yeah. you kind of get back on track? For sure. And there's For something sure. in you that says, mm-hmm. oh, I've kind of gone too far. And I don't like leaves. it. Yeah, yep. I don't like it. And it's nice for me to get back to where my center is. Exactly. I call it my center, but like my center of where I want to be. And it, I love that feeling yes. of coming back. And those of us who don't have a heavy magnetic pull back to a center, we have to create it externally. That's what the bright lines help to do. And that's what the community helps to do. That's what the program helps to do. We're, we're basically Jerry rigging ourselves to be like you because <laughs> our brains don't get rewiring your brain. Yeah. 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 I think that's a great way to close this out. Talking about the holidays that air, will you say those three one more time? Automaticity, yep. identity, and resume. So when you talk about those three things and the holidays particularly, and we're going to talk about this more in a later podcast with you, but those three things coming off of the holidays and getting yeah. back on track and getting to where you want to be, I think are critical when, and in lifestyle. That's all not, the next episode. It's not a quick mm-hmm. change. It's a lifestyle. And those mm-hmm. three things, I think those are three really important keys to living a lifestyle. Totally. And the next episode is going to be all about goal setting, January 1st, New Year's resolutions. That's a good place to start with those three things, Mm -hmm. really processing those for yourself as you go into what's next. And I just want to presence, you're about to set New Year's resolutions. You're going to do it wrong, but I got your back because we're going to talk about the science of goal setting in the next podcast and it'll be fixable. However you want to set your New Year's resolutions, go ahead. And then I'm going to give you a little psychological tweak that's going to give it lasting power. Which which is perfect because you're going to join us next week for our next Mm -hmm. episode um, on January 2nd. So you are our bright line eating Sherpa and you're going to help lead us to better goal setting, better mindset, better lifestyle changes on our next episode. That's right. I got your back. <clears throat> you need Listen. to add that next time for your intro. Brightline eating Sherpa. Exactly. That's a thing now. <laughs> it's a thing. <laughs>
So thank you everybody for listening. Go to empoweringyouorganically.com. You can get all of Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson's links to her sites, to her quiz, to the free videos, to her book on Amazon or wherever else you want to get it. Anything you need to know, you can go there. And thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.